gun Ramos looking like he's got one more good run Sips a little shaky But his heart is still true Oh how that dog loves hunting with me and you Sporting dog adventures run boy run Everything you need is here under the sun Hey, this is Jeff Fuller of Soggy Acres Retrievers and Sporting Dog Adventures TV. We have had a great run showing our love for dogs with our show, our podcast, our social media, and all that is based on Soggy Acres Retrievers. We proudly bring this podcast to you by Soggy Acres Retrievers and ask you, if you are looking for training, boarding, or a yellow, black, or chocolate Labrador Retriever puppies, please check out SoggyAcres.com. Remember, everyone deserves a Soggy Dog. Welcome to the Sporting Dog Adventures Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Fuller. I own Soggy Acres Retrievers, and I love dogs. If you are looking for a dog-related show, you have found it. We have a passion for it, and you are going to love the different topics we talk about. On today's show, we're going to talk about... Designer breeds, different colors, and how that is affecting the dog breeding industry. We're going to talk about the training concept of having patience, consistency, and using lots of praise. And in the hunting tip, we're actually going to talk a little bit about our new podcast that should be upcoming that will pair and go along with this podcast. Well, not pair and go along because they're not related, but it'll give us a broader range of topics, I think would be the best way to put it. So let's get right to our new topic for the day, and that's new colors and designer breeds. You will often see things in the dog world where people are now mixing breeds and making things up. So you have the Labradoodle. Folks, there is no such thing or breed as a Labradoodle, so there's no standards. It is a mixed breed of a Lab and a Poodle. And there's Doodle everything now. I know they are claimed to be hypoallergenic. I have talked to many people that bought them, and it did not work out that way. Again, because you don't have that standard where there is a overall group that is saying this is what you need to have to qualify. On Labrador Retrievers, we have different colors. We now have champagne, we have charcoal, we have silver. Again, if you look at the founding club for Labrador Retrievers, you will see that these are not colors that exist, which would mean that you have a mixed breed dog. This isn't to say that if you have a doodle something or a dog that is not the correct color, that's a bad dog. Everyone loves their dogs. But as a society, we need to look at these standards as a dog society, look at these standards and look at what the clubs and what the dogs were designed for so that we are putting out something that is to that breed standard. If someone wants to start another breed, that's fantastic. If you want to have a dog that is a retriever, that is silver or champagne or charcoal, that's awesome, but it should be a separate breed. If you want to have a dog that is a mix between two breeds, that's outstanding. Go ahead and set it up but don't claim you have a purebred when indeed it's not. And a lot of this is one, it's, it's people. If you look back on the creation of the Labradoodle, the person that created it actually has said he started a monster that he wished he'd never had. Yes, the guy that started that mix or that crossbreeding has said he wished he never did. And you also look at something like the Silver Lab, Champagne Lab, Charcoal Lab, that is a product of the American Kennel Clubs telling people, you know what, it's close enough, go ahead and mark it as a chocolate. Well, if it's not a chocolate, you shouldn't have a chocolate marked down. In Labrador Retrievers, there are three colors that are recognized. There is the black the chocolate, and then the yellow. The yellow will range from, from an almost white to all the way to a fox reddish color. So if you have a whitish dog or a, a white lab or a fox red lab that is a yellow lab, 
the reason that you have these these different coat variations, these were coat variations that were seen in the Labrador Retriever when the breed was founded. The designer colors have not shown up until the 80s, and magically they come out of kennels that had both a Weimariner and Labrador Retrievers, from what I've researched. And it is something that, yes, you probably have a dog that is 99% Labrador Retriever or 98%, but again, we're talking purebred. So we need to get away from having those recognized as one thing and then calling them another. And if you have a mix or a type that you want to produce, set it up as a new breed. When we look at breeds, there's the breed standard that is set up by the clubs and the founding members of that breed where it will say what the dog all needs to have. It's not set up as a snobby way. It's not set up just basically like, hey, this is what a Labrador Retriever is, or this is what a Golden Retriever is, or this is what an Australian Shepherd is. You have the standard set up. It will tell you what, exhibit, what, what the dog should exhibit. And then from there, that is a standard that's supposed to be held for that dog as they are bred into the future. So again, this isn't to say that people's dogs are anything other than great dogs, but it's just more looking at the actual designation, the registry, and what a purebred dog is so that we aren't mixing the two. I've had people that have called me about certain mixed breeds between one and another and have said, you know, it's a uh, Chesador. Um, there is no Chesador. No, this person had one and, and, and they bred them. No, they had a Chesapeake in a lab that probably accidentally bred and now they're trying to make something up. We need to not look at that. We need to celebrate dog breeds, purebred dog breeds for what they are, and then move forward from there. If it is, again, if it is something that you want to look at, and start your own breed up. There's ways to look into it. There's ways to do that. It might take a very long time, but there's not much I can give you on that other than to talk to the uh, these uh, registry, registry organizations, and they will give you the steps you have to do. So that is going to be it for today's topic, main topic. Next, we are going to talk about what you need to do to be in a quality position, to have a quality a quality plan for training and that would be using patience consistency and praise when working with your dog so we'll have all that and more coming up in our training tip after this our great fans of the sporting dog adventures podcast we are growing at an astronomical rate and i want to thank you all i do ask one thing from you please give us a five-star rating on itunes please give us a thumbs up Follow us, subscribe to us on whatever other platforms you're on. And the most important thing I can ask, share our podcast with your friends so that we can grow our love for the dogs and dogs in the field and make it so that people are more involved in our sport. Again, thank you so much for being listeners. Take care. Jeff Fuller from Sporting Dog Adventures and Soggy Acres Retrievers. In our house, my wife hates having the plastic kennels and wire crates. We need them for the dogs because we have times when they need to be put somewhere. But she cannot stand the look. So we talked to DCT Kennels and we now have a new partnership with them for a product that is a crate but also a piece of furniture. If you want something that is practical as well as great looking, check out DCT Kennels. Welcome back to the show. I often get questions on what a good training program is or what a tr good training program should have. And I fall back into the same conversation that I've probably talked about numerous times, but it's always worth repeating. A good training program is going to have carrot and stick. You're going to have a negative consequence when the dog does not do something that it was trained to do, something it understands, a command it knows, and also a positive, over-the-top, when the dog does what it's supposed to. We have to have patience with dogs. There are so many times when you can lose your patience. Trust me, I work with dogs all year long where the dog knows what you want, they decide to be self-employed, and you get incredibly frustrated. Realize that their job is to frustrate you. Your job is to be patient, consistent, and to give them lots of praise. 
Again, consistency in that you still have your negative consequence, whether it is using a pinch collar, the word no, a stern voice, or an e-collar, and use it consistently the first time after a dog does not listen. If you tell a dog to sit, the dog does not sit. Next time is sit with correction. I am a huge proponent of collars, so next time it will be sit with a nick from the collar. We have to also keep in mind that you want to have over-the-top praise and make praise 80 to 90% of what you are providing the dog and feedback when they do something properly. This is going to give you a great training attitude from your dog and make it a lot easier for them to make the decision, do I want to be corrected or do I want lots of love and praise? Keep that in mind. That is going to help you as you work with your dogs in the future, and it'll help you as you pick a program and look at what you're going to use for training your dog. That's it for today's training tip. Next, we are going to go into how our waterfowl season has been going on our hunt this year, as well as some news on a new podcast coming up in the future. All that and more coming up after this. Jeff Fuller again from Soggy Acres Retrievers and Sporting Dog Adventures Podcast. When you look at hunting, you need to have yourself prepared. Our good friends at Mac Outdoors have reloading supplies as well as great clay target machines to get you prepared so you have more success in the field. Don't get that dirty look from your dog. Check out Mac Outdoors. Hey, this is Jeff Fuller from Sporting Dog Adventures Podcast. I want you to know that we buy all of our trucks at Boucher Automotive. We go to Janesville. They've got a great selection, great staff. If you're looking for a new truck or car, check out our friends at Boucher Automotive in Janesville. Hey, welcome back to the show. I know in the first part of the show, I said we were going to talk about a new podcast that we're working on. Now, I also want to talk about how our waterfall season went. What a rough year. We're drawing to a conclusion I had a very rough year, and it sounds like the majority of people I know in Wisconsin also had a rough year. The migration was very inconsistent, and I think a lot of what hurt us this year was we were in very dry conditions. Now, coming from a guy that owns all marshes in three different places, I was not unhappy that it was dry. The wet has played havoc with me here at my house and at both my hunting and training properties. So it was nice to have a dry year. I honestly thought that the fact that we had water, even though it was dry, would mean we'd be the only game in town. But for some reason, I guess Mother Nature would have to tell me, the lack of water in the area really, really put a a damper on the amount of birds we had. I'm assuming what happened is the birds stuck over near bigger water like the Mississippi River, and that is what kind of steered them out of our area. But I will not know until I get to talk to some biologists. I'm looking to get some information on it, just not even for the show, but just out of curiosity. Overall, we had, I would say, the poorest year I've had since I owned my properties, and last year was my best. So, of course, last year, we were incredibly wet. I made the decision, I'm not going to big game hunt, I'm not going to deer hunt as much, I'm going to really take what what is given to me here. I'm going to enjoy duck season. Hopefully I get a nice deer. And what happens? I got my deer early. I shot a really nice buck. And I haven't had much to do since because there just haven't been birds. So go figure. Murphy's Law. I have a journal I keep track of everything in. I will have a basically write-up on how the season went in my little journal that we keep up at the hunting lodge. And it will be interesting to look back on in 10 years and see if there's consistency in what we had this year as opposed to what we have in years of the future. Now, next, I wanted to talk to you about another passion of mine. It's funny because people always think that I am a huge waterfowl guy and have become that with the TV show that we had, Sporting Dog Adventures. But ultimately, I used to be only deer and upland. And got into waterfowl once we started filming. Now, it wasn't because I didn't like waterfowl hunting. I went a few times, but it was just because I only had so much time. I have a great passion for elk hunting and deer hunting, big game hunting. I love upland. And it is something that has driven me to come up with 
an idea for a new podcast that we are going to be releasing here in the next couple of weeks. I'm not going to give the name yet until it's actually out, but this podcast will be focused on hunting in general and not just the narrow look at dogs, dogs in the field, and hunting with dogs. So it's going to give us a, a more a more broad topic of conversations to talk about. We will talk about our deer season that we had this year, talk about an elk hunt that I'm going on next year, <coughs> and still talk about upland and waterfowl, but it'll just give us more variety in the topic. I don't know many people that only waterfowl hunt. There are some really hardcore guys, but most people will do a little of everything, and that's been my life. I like to hunt everything that I can legally hunt. We are going to talk about it, and it's going to be a great topic for a new passion of ours, which is our new podcast. <coughs> Thank you so much for checking in and listening to us today. If you can, please like us, follow us, share us, donate to us, do whatever you can to help spread our podcast, the fastest growing dog-related podcast in podcast world. I just made that up, but it's really grown fast. I cannot believe how much we have added, how many uh, how many new listeners we have, the feedback we get with emails. So again, please help us grow in any way you can so that we can share our love of hunting the field and hunting the field with dogs and hopefully get more people involved in the sport we all love. That is it for today. It is the Wisconsin Gun Deer opener coming up this weekend. I hope everyone in Wisconsin stays safe. For everyone else, I hope you are having a great season. I hope that you are safe. I hope it uh, it is the best year you've ever had. We will be back next week. I don't know what day, but we'll be back next week with more. Thank you so much for listening, everyone, and tuning in. God bless. Sporting dog adventures run, boy, run. Everything you need is here under the sun.